Alpha on this Trinity Sunday to the worship service of Myersville Presbyterian Church and First Presbyterian Church of Sterling, both in Long Hill Township, New Jersey. Now, I will be at my husband's high school reunion, so though there are a few updates, this worship service is largely an encore presentation of the Trinity Sunday service from a previous year. If you remember it from back then, I am very gratified. If not, it will be as new, equally gratifying. Both churches are conducting special mission collections. First Presbyterian continues to gather funds to be ready to purchase grocery gift cards for the family promise guests. These are folks who have become homeless and the Family Promise Ministry supports these families with shelter and food and other services to help them get back up on their feet. Myersville's special mission for the month of June is the, the statewide community food bank, which is a food collection and distribution ministry that supplies food to more than 1,000 nonprofit programs throughout the state of New Jersey, including our own local 12 Baskets Food Pantry. If you would like to participate in either or both of these special missions, please send your check to the respective church. And now, let us worship God. Join me in the call to worship with the words on the screen. Ascribe to God glory and strength. Ascribe to God the glory of God's name. We gather to worship God. In response to God's power, we say glory. May the Lord give strength to the people. May the Lord bless the people with peace. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you. Through your word and Holy Spirit, you create all things. You, you re reveal your salvation to all the world by sending to us, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Through your Holy Spirit, you give us a share in your life and love. Fill us with the vision of your glory that we may always praise and serve you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. We pray all this in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. the prophet Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am the man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. From the Gospel according to John, chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. 
Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Theologian Soren Kierkegaard tells the story of a community of ducks waddling off to Duck Church. And the duck preacher spoke eloquently of how God had given the ducks wings with which to fly. With these wings, there was nowhere the ducks could not go. There was no God-given task that the ducks could not accomplish. With those wings, they could soar into the presence of God. And shouts of amen were quacked throughout the duck congregation. And at the end of this worship service, the ducks left, commenting on what a wonderful message they heard. And then they waddled all the way home. The ducks had come to worship. A wonderful thing. But somehow they left the same as they came. They were unmoved, unchanged, unchallenged. Maybe it was just habit. I bet those ducks all sat in the same pews each week. They probably knew most of the service by heart. And maybe they thought that though the sermon was a good one, it was probably really meant for someone else. Well, not so for the prophet Isaiah on the day he went to worship in the temple, on the day of the annual enthronement celebration in the year that King Uzziah died. Something amazing, special, life-changing happened to him on that day. Isaiah had fairly recently retired as counselor to the court of King Ahaz. Against the advice of Isaiah, an alliance had been made between Ahaz and their neighbor, Assyria, a threatening neighbor. And this reliance on a political and military solution to Israel's problems ran counter to Isaiah's efforts to bring the people into a closer alliance with and reliance on God. And so Isaiah left the court, giving up on trying to change things from the inside. 
The reference to the year that King Uzziah died is significant because King Uzziah had been a popular and very effective king for 52 years. Under his leadership, the nation of Israel had enjoyed peace and prosperity for many years. Life was good. The economy was robust. The polls showed high consumer confidence. And all of the leading economic indicators pointed to more of the same. And it had all been done with what was perceived to be human effort and ingenuity. Uzziah's son, Jotham, was less popular, and the people were a little unsure of his abilities. And so it was into this atmosphere that Isaiah experienced his call to change job descriptions and become not a retired advisor, a counselor of kings, but a prophet of the Lord. And that call came on the day he went to the temple for the enthronement celebration. Really, it was a kind of religious reenactment or play that depicted the return of the divine king to his temple as victor over the forces of evil, and then his crowning as king, as creator and judge. And in the midst of this grand but probably pretty staid and ritualized ceremony, something amazing happened. This dignified, educated, privileged elder statesman, courtier Isaiah, had a vision, a vision of the Lord. Huge, magnificent, glorious, filling the giant space of the temple with these two gigantic six-winged seraphim attendants hovering above, displaying the proper respect in the presence of God. With two wings, they covered their faces so they wouldn't be blinded by the light of the holiness of God. With two wings, they covered their naked parts out of respect. And with two wings, they were just ready to fly to the tasks appointed them. Isaiah heard one seraph call to the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And vibrations from the sound of the seraph's voice shook the building and there was smoke filling the enormous space. And all Isaiah can think of in the midst of all this is, boy, am I in trouble now. I'm a goner for sure. Because I know that if anyone sees God, they will surely die. And here I am seeing God. He expected to be struck down at any second because he knew he was unworthy of such a thing as seeing God. But he was not struck down. Something peculiar happened. One of those great winged seraphim flew over to the altar where a fire was burning and took with some tongs a, a live coal and touched Isaiah's mouth with it, symbolically burning away the guilt of whatever sin was in him. And the very next thing Isaiah heard was God asking, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah, it seems, couldn't help but respond, Here am I, send me. And Isaiah's life was turned upside down. The encounter in the temple not only gave him forgiveness, but gave him a new purpose for living, a calling, a vocation to which he devoted the rest of his life. Something dramatic happened to Isaiah in that worship service. Though the service itself, the ceremony, the ritual, had probably happened many, many times over the centuries. This time, something unplanned happened. It was unrehearsed, uncontrolled. To Isaiah, it seemed that the entire building, the entire temple just shook with the presence of God. It was an encounter with God so profound that he could no longer see himself or his people in the same way. 
But you know, I wonder about the other people at that worship service in the temple that day. Because there would have been lots of others there for the annual enthronement ceremony. Did anything so dramatic and profound happen to them as, the, as happened to Isaiah? Did anything change in how they viewed themselves or viewed God? And how is it that two different people can hear the same piece of music, pray the same prayers, hear the same sermon, and one can be absolutely transformed by the experience while the other is unmoved, unchanged. What makes the same service of worship a profound encounter with God for one person and a routine ritual for another? Because sometimes it does happen, even now, right now, in the midst of a worship service. Actual worship happens. Someone's eyes are open to a greater awareness of the majesty of God by the music, or someone recognizes themselves in the scripture reading and a true faith begins. Someone hears the sermon for, for real this time. Or someone trusts the forgiveness in Christ and new hope is born. All of this is something you know, we can't really explain it. We can't account for it. Though sometimes it can be described, as Isaiah did. Isaiah's story reminds us that the radical presence of God is found not only in the, in the spectacular and the extraordinary, but in the ordinary as well. What made it possible for Isaiah was his willingness to be open to see through the smoke and ritual of the enthronement ceremony to what the ceremony represented. He was not content to experience only the ritual, but was open to the actual presence of God. But this awareness is difficult in a time of ease and prosperity, when we expect things to be ever more sensational and dramatic and entertaining. There was the movie Die Hard, and the sequel just had to be Die Harder. Reality TV shows each have to have just a little more outrageous premise, a little more outrageous behavior than the last one. And each Fast and Furious movie got, of course, faster and furiouser with number nine in the series come out, coming out just next month. Though Isaiah's experience as he described it, his vision, was very dramatic, it happened in a quite ordinary circumstance. Of course, Isaiah knew as a faithful Jew that God is always present. But on that day in the temple, he knew God's presence in a more immediate, in-your-face kind of way. Or there's the story of Jacob running away from his mischievous past, from his father and his angry brother Esau, toward an uncertain reception by his uncle Laban, whom he had never met. And along the way, he stopped to rest, the stars above him and a rock for his pillow. And in this unlikely place, the radical presence of God the immediate, in-your-face presence of God entered Jacob's dreams, and he woke up saying, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he made a little pile of stones to remember the place and his experience there. Or think of Moses, who knew the presence of God in this way in the wilderness. For Elijah, it was in a mountain hideout. For Saul, who became Paul, it was on a bounty hunting expedition to Damascus. And then, of course, there's the most radical presence of God, the incarnation, Jesus, which began in a barn out in the countryside. It can happen anytime, any place. And though it was in the temple for Isaiah, 
It cannot be planned or, or made to happen. As much as I plan our worship services each week, choosing the scripture, writing prayers and a sermon, choosing hymns, I cannot make you know the presence of God in the service. Roberta and our singers plan and prepare and practice. But again, the music cannot cause worship to happen. A fine performance by any of us in front of the church or in front of the camera does not make our service a worship service. The only thing that can really make worship happen is the meeting between human inadequ inadequacy and the grace of God, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is what happened to Isaiah. In the midst of a very ordinary temple service, he came face to face with the glory, the magnificence of God, and saw himself in relation to it, and suddenly recognized his own smallness and shortcomings and those of his fellow Israelites. He recognized his need for forgiveness and his people's need to change. But God does not reveal God's glory to us in order to overwhelm us or make us feel worthless or stupid. That's not the point. The point of it is to remind us of the power of God's grace to transform us, that we have access through Christ to this power, this magnificence, this glory, that all that power can be applied to our, to our confusion, our, our misunderstandings, our greed, our sin, so that we can be forgiven and restored. Just because God loves us. Human inadequacy meets divine grace, and worship happens. No sooner had Isaiah confessed than God assured him of forgiveness. How do we know that worship happened? How do we know that Isaiah was restored, that he was changed? We know because he interrupted a conversation between those two seraphim and God to volunteer. He said, send me. Isaiah's gratitude prompted him to interrupt and offer himself. Gratitude for God's grace, gratitude for forgiveness, gratitude for the experience of God's presence in such a, a dramatic and insistent way. When we are touched by God, we can't sit still. We can't be quiet. Something has to happen as a consequence of the experience. Gratitude drives us to obey Christ's teachings. Gratitude makes us not only willing, but eager to respond to the call of God, to not only be changed, but to work at changing the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that you bless us all sometimes with your radical presence. Whether it's in a big way or a small way, may it move us, change us, so fill us with gratitude and peace that we cannot sit still. May participation in our worship service open us to your presence. Grant us a sense of your transcendent holiness. Enable us to not only hear your call, but to respond to it, not only to listen, but to understand. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a mind to understand, so that we may thus equip, abide in your service, until we see the whole earth full of your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Oh.
Let us pray. O Holy One, ever mysterious to us, yet ever among us, we thank you for your placing within us a quest for you and your truth. Today we pray for our hurting world, that war makers will find peace, that the hungry will find food, that refugees will find shelter, that injustice will be answered with all that is right and good. O oh God, our land is troubled and our peace is disturbed. O oh God of love and life, guide us by your truth. Inspire us with courage to proclaim your love to root out the enemies of righteousness, to work toward peace in our world. We pray for all who suffer, for those we love dearly, for those we barely know, for those whose suffering we have ignored. Be present in the healing touch of all hands that help the sick and suffering, and send your spirit to comfort and protect all who need you. We pray for those who are struggling, for those who can't see a way through broken relationships or difficult financial realities, emotional darkness, or loneliness. May they find you even in the most hopeless places. May they find us, your people, too, in those places, bringing good news and hope to all who are longing for something new. We pray for all who are joyful. We rejoice in the promise of new life and old lives made new. We celebrate the movement, your movement, through milestones, births, graduations, new jobs, new relationships, the promise of something wonderful ahead. We remember those moments of blessing in our own lives. We thank you for the opportunity to use our lives to your glory to live lives that are full and worthy of your calling. We bind ourselves, O oh God, today to the strong name of the Trinity, and we name you three in one, one in three, and claim our place in your community of love. Be with us, within us, behind us, before us. May we be your comfort, your restoration, and your peace and wholeness in the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
go out into the world in peace, rejoicing in the promise and the power of the presence of God in our lives. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Speak.